Hey friends, welcome to my office here at the Highland Oaks Church, and I'm grateful that you've joined us here for uh, a discipleship gathering here uh, through the wonders of social media and online technology. I want to thank, uh, to begin with, my technical directors, Mr. Josh Tracy and Chad Higgins, who are with me here in the office uh, recording this Bible study. And you know, that's what we're going to do is we're just going to open the Bible here and continue on in our study of First Thessalonians. So if you have your Bible or your tablet or something, I invite you to go ahead and get that now. We're going to continue on right where we left off in First Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. And I hope you're ready to study the Bible because that's what we're about to do. So let's read and then I'll offer a word of prayer and uh, we'll just kind of march through these verses like we have been. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, 6 through 13. This is the word of God for you, uh, the people of God. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love. He has told us also that you always remember us kindly and long to see us, just as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers and sisters, during all our distress and persecution, we have been encouraged about you through your faith. For we now live. If you continue to stay firm in the Lord, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Let's pray. Um, God, thank you for this space, for this medium of communication, and for my friends that are uh, quarantined at home and might be nervous and might be scared or panicked, uh, would you just be near and would you just continue to um, help us to look to you for guidance and to listen to you in these times of crisis? God, we want to remain calm. We don't want to be anxious. We don't want to worry, but we know that in all things, you will be the steady guide for our lives, for it's in your name that I pray. Amen. All right. Hope you've got your iPad. Maybe you've got your coffee. Uh, you've got your Bible. Uh, let me begin with a story that I heard from a preacher uh, the other week that talked about an older gentleman and a little boy that were going to take a trip, going to take a journey, and they were headed out with their donkey and they came to the first city and of course they gave some advice they said to the older man how dare you walk this whole way why don't you ride on the donkey so the old man of course heeded the advice got on the donkey and the young man walked and they came to the next city at which they stopped and received even more advice and the city said how dare you ride on the donkey while the young boy walks you should be the one walking. The young boy should be the one riding on the donkey. So they heeded the advice and off they went to the next city at which the city said, you know, have you thought about both of you riding the donkey? And so they thought to themselves, you know, that's good advice too. So they both rode on the donkey until they got to the next city and to the next stop. And wouldn't you know it, they received even more advice. How dare you both ride on the donkey? That is such an inconvenience to that poor donkey. And as you can probably imagine what happened next, the man and the boy were both seen carrying the donkey onto their next place of, uh, of rest. And as you can imagine, we have all kinds of advice coming our way, don't we? We have advice to stay home. We have advice to only get out to certain places, certain uh, businesses, certain restaurants. But really the only true advice we ought to be listening to is the advice that we're given uh, through the words of God. And I just want to encourage you to think about how uh, 
wonderful it is to actually have these words that were written over 2,000 years ago. And we have someone like Paul writing to real people in real time that we can read and think about ways that we can apply this to our life. And, and let's just be honest, we have all kinds of people telling us to either uh, ride the donkey ourselves, or take somebody with us or to even carry the donkey. But we are going to work on moving forward and listening to God's advice. So here we are in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3 beginning in verse 6 and Paul talks about of course sending uh, Timothy to the church there in Thessalonians. But Paul says that Timothy brought us good news of your faith and love. Now that word good news is the same word for the gospel that's used there in uh, in the four gospel accounts, as you might remember, the Euon Gelion. And there's a double meaning there. If, if Timothy is bringing Paul good news, uh, Timothy is actually bringing the gospel in the gospel. In other words, it's the good news of the report of how the good news is actually being lived out among the Thessalonians. I, I think Paul has confidence in God, but also confidence in their conduct, which is why he says, you know, there, there's faith and love that's here at stake. It's not just the belief in God, the faith in God, but it's also the behavior of the Thessalonians, their their conduct. And of course, as you well know from earlier in this uh, in this study, this has all been orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. Paul even says earlier in chapter one, um, you became imitators of us and of the Lord because that has been inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's in chapter one verse 6. So I just want to remind you that Paul doesn't just send Timothy to get an encouraging report, but rather it's a report of how the Thessalonians or the Thessalonians are moving forward in faith and in love. And there's a difference between knowing God and actually practicing what you know about God. I was reminded of when uh, my oldest son went on his first date, and as I began kind of uh, giving him some instruction or reminding him of some things, you know, you know, be sure and open the door and this, that, and the other, he kind of pushed back a little bit and he said, I know, Dad, I know. I know what to do. And then I thought to myself, well, there's a difference in actually knowing what to do and actually doing it. And that's really where Paul is coming from here in Thessalonians, as he is wanting Timothy to bring back this report that, sure, they know about God, but are they actually doing it? Are they living their lives in a particular way? I also want you to notice that Paul says that Timothy told them that the Thessalonians remembered Paul, and they longed to see Paul just as Paul longed to see them. Did you ever think about the fact that Paul might have just wondered um, if those that he shared the gospel with actually uh, remembered him with the same affection that he uh, thought about them? Um, it, it's kind of like getting Christmas cards in the mail um, each December where maybe you get a card from somebody you hadn't seen in several months or haven't talked to, to and, and there's this feeling of, that's really kind that they would actually think to send me a Christmas card. But what's even better is not just a Christmas card that's that's canned or formal, but that includes a personal note where where you know that that you aren't just somebody that they're sending a card to but you are somebody that they actually remember with deep affection you see that's what that's what Paul is is looking for he he's concerned about losing contact and he wants to pick up where they left off and once again it's a reminder of the deep sense of community that Paul experiences with those he shares the gospel with and as you can recall a few weeks ago when we studied that that Paul did not just share the gospel but his life as well and that's what we're invited to do is not just share in a Bible study but to share in our lives as well and how the the study of God's Word actually invites us to share life together. Paul also says, for this reason, during all our distress and persecution, we've been encouraged um, about you through your 
faith. In other words, the encouraged became the encouragers. The gospel is at work even in those who have received the gospel. And I'm sure all of you can recall times when you've been on a visit or maybe you've uh, been to see someone on a trip or maybe you've received family and you've said something like, you know, you've really blessed me a lot more than what I thought I was blessing you with. And in other words, uh, you know, you really helped me. Uh, and here I was thinking that I was the one that was going to help you. You know, there was a time in college where Deborah and I were singing with, you know, a small group of singers and we went to sing at a prison. And of course, there was some some nervousness there as we entered into this really this sacred space. And I can remember, it, and it was an all-female prison, and several of the inmates came out, of course, in their in their orange jumpsuits. And as we did this concert, I can just remember the feeling that we had as these women who were incarcerated began to express themselves loud and audibly, even making us clearly very uncomfortable. But I remember walking away from there thinking, you know, here we were thinking that we were the ones bringing them encouragement, but we were the ones who walked away most encouraged by their faith, by their trials. And I think that's what Paul is getting at here, is that the people that he is interacting with um, on a daily basis in those churches, when he hears back from them, he is the one that receives encouragement from the encouragement he's given. And, and I just don't want to lose sight of that powerful moment there in the gospel. Um, in verse eight, Paul says that uh, he and those that he are with, that he is with, now live as the church there in Thessalonica continues to stand firm in the Lord. Now that that word there, stand firm. Um, I want you to keep in mind that, that that's a Greek word that would have been very familiar with the church there, but it's a military term. Standing firm does not mean that you stand firm as, as someone, as an individual, but rather it's a military term for the Roman army as they continue to stand firm together. It's that image over in Ephesians chapter 6 where Paul invites the church there in Ephesus to, to continue to, to stand firm in the armor of God. So it, there's no way that they could stand firm as an individual. It's continuing to remind them of standing together. So isn't it interesting uh, during this time and during this crisis that we are being invited to stand together e even without close physical contact? It's an invitation to remember that we can't do this alone. We shouldn't have to do this alone. And wouldn't it be interesting if the one good thing that came out of this awful coronavirus and these really hard times of quarantine, wouldn't it be interesting if, if the gospel was really reminding us of our deep need and dependence on one another, that we, we are standing firm together. We shouldn't have to do this alone. I mean, even yesterday as I was out walking my dog, I saw neighbors talking to each other outside. I saw uh, people gathering on the sidewalk. Of course, they were practicing their social distancing, but it was so fascinating to see how such a crisis and an invitation to quarantine is actually bringing people together. You see, I think that's what Paul is after when he's talking about enduring distress and persecution. You don't have to do this alone. You stand firm together. And I love what Paul says next in verse 9. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Paul is experiencing such incredible joy because of the faithfulness of those that he has taught and lived with for a particular amount of time. Um, do you have anybody in your home or in your circle of influence that you can look at and, and think to yourself, wow, they, they've really grown in their awareness and knowledge of the gospel. And there's just such a joy that I am filled with because of their uh, deep understanding and their continuing maturation in the gospel. 
I never will forget um, Deborah's grandmother uh, and, of course, grandfather. Of course, we call him Mama and Papa. They lived on this farm right outside of Searcy, Arkansas. And after Papa died, uh, Mama made the difficult decision to sell the farm which was a, a really difficult thing for the family to even imagine because every memory they had it at Christmas or anniversaries, even when all of us kind of came to college there at Harding, we all knew that the farm was a place where we could come and gather. And Mama wanted to have this final you know, reunion where we would sit out in the backyard, gather our chairs around, and sing hymns out of the songbook together. And I can remember sitting there in the backyard. Of course, it was in the middle of July. It was so hot. The mosquitoes were everywhere. But I can remember Mama could barely sing. She was so tearful. And then when we asked her, Mama, can you help us understand those tears? She would simply say, I'm just so grateful for the faithfulness of my children, the faithfulness of my grandchildren, and the faithfulness of future great-grandchildren. Uh, what a testimony that was to me about someone who was filled with joy, not because of her own faith, but because of the faith of someone else. You see, that's what Paul is getting at here in Thessalonians. He is filled with so much joy, maybe even with tears streaming down his face as Timothy comes to him and says, Paul, you're not going to believe the faith of the Thessalonians. And that just brings Paul so much joy. So in verse 10, Paul says, night and day, we pray most earnestly that we can see you face to face. Uh, there again, this deep relational uh, connection, night and day. Not that Paul is, is a super prayer where every single moment of every single day he's praying, but it, it's, it's a posture of prayer rather than some preface that we take to a meal or to a ball game or to an assembly. Uh, Paul has a posture of praying for those people that he is deeply connected with. And so I want to ask you, um, I know you've been praying through this crisis, but have you been praying for other people? Have you been praying for those that you are close to, that you can surround yourself with? You know, it's a reminder once again that we are connected. We're standing firm together. So pray night and day for those that we are deeply connected with. And then Paul says something really interesting. Paul says that he's praying that, that he could restore whatever is lacking in their faith. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean that Paul still thinks that there's some things that they are clearly lacking? Well, I think there's a there's two ways of looking at that when you lack something. It's either something that you know you're not able to obtain yet, or maybe you just missed it, or perhaps that there's something that is still you know needed. Um, that there's something that is still needed and Paul can't wait to continue to to share that knowledge or to share that gift with them. Um, as some of you know, um, the reason I picked Thessalonians was it was my very first graduate class at Abilene Christian University. And I can remember that I was a little puzzled the first day because Dr. Enfair, who is kind of this wise, um, sage-like um, person, he came in and the only thing he had to teach was his Bible. And it was amazing because he just opened up his Bible and sat on a stool and just began to teach us verse by verse from First and Second Thessalonians. And I can remember coming back each day. Now keep in mind, this was a class that went from like 8, 30, 9 o'clock in the morning to like 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And of course there was discussion, but I can remember just hanging on every single word the man was saying. Why? It wasn't because he was just a, a phenomenal interactive teacher, but because I could tell that there was so much wisdom he had to offer and there was so much that I was lacking. Uh, my age and my maturity just didn't give me the same level of awareness that I needed. And I remember hanging on every single word that he said. I, I think that's what Paul is getting at here. The Thessalonians aren't lacking because they've dropped the ball in some way or they haven't performed in a way that has, has uh, displeased God. But Paul still has so much more to share with them. And it's just a reminder of, again, of this journey that we share as we 
journey together as disciples that love, that grow, that send, that especially that that idea of growing. Growing never stops, but we need to be better about listening to each other as we continue to 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 live life together. So Paul makes a transition in verse 11, and I want you to look at your Bibles because uh, here in the NRSV, um, it says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Um, Paul is making a significant transition here in his letter writing where he is going to give uh, a benediction or a prayer of blessing, uh, much like we do in our in our services on Sunday morning in our gatherings where the elders get up and give their final benediction, their final prayer of blessing. That's what Paul is doing. And I want you to imagine that you're sitting here in Thessalonica um, listening to this letter written by somebody that you know loves you so deeply. And then Paul is going to say, Now, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you. I, this is just a beautiful moment of intercession that prayer that Paul is going to have on behalf of those that he loves. And Paul says, may God and the Lord Jesus direct our way. I mean, it, it's a matter of direction. It's because of God and the work of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that Paul has a very clear way uh, of heading towards the Thessalonians and gravitating again towards their heart. And listen to this language in verse 12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another. For Paul, once again, love is the entire fulfillment of the Christian story. Love is the behavior. I mean, can't you just hear Papa George even now reminding us that love is the most important thing? Look, without a doubt, Paul thought that faith in God was important, but if faith in God wasn't translated into living for God with love, I, it was all pointless. I mean, isn't that what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? You know, the greatest of these, faith, hope, and love, but at the end of the day, it's love. It's faith expressing itself through love that Paul says in another letter that he writes. So he wants to remind them that they are to not just love each other, but abound in love. It's something that grows. It's something that extends. But pay attention to what Paul also says. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another, and for all. In other words, the love shouldn't be contained to the church community, but it's love that's extended into the community around them. It's just bizarre to me how we think that the love of God can only be experienced in the confines of a church building or just simply like through this secret code that we have with those who belong to a particular church. But Love is the very mark of who we are as believers. People should notice something different about us, not just because of our faith in God, but because our faith in God moves us to love people in particular ways. I love one of the things that our shepherds and I, what we try to do in our meetings is we try to ask one fundamental question. You know, it's that one thing. You remember Curly from City Slickers when Billy Crystal uh, asks him the secret or the meaning of life and and Curly so wisely says one thing and Billy Crystal's like, well, what is the one thing? And Curly just says, well, that's for you to figure out, but you've got to find that one thing. For Paul, we know the one thing. The one thing is love. And so that question that our shepherds and I, what we continually wrestle with is this one question, what does love require? I think that's what Paul is moving the Thessalonians to see is that at the end of the day, their faith in God leads them to ask that one predominant question. What does love require? Which is why Paul prays that their love might abound not only for each other, but also for the community that surrounds them. Paul also says that, um, that they need to be strengthened in their hearts in holiness so that they may be blameless before God. And, and just that idea of being strengthened and being blameless, once again, Paul is reminding them that their strength comes not from themselves, but from God. And it's not a present accomplishment 
but an eternal outcome that Paul is pushing towards when he talks about the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. It's this desire to live in such a way that 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 you might um, live into that which God has prepared for you. It's it's a way of of framing your life with the end in mind. And I think that matters so much that Paul always has, you know, the end in mind. And he always lives his life with this, um, not this idealistic things are going to work out, but it's hope. Uh, It's hope that that drives Paul to say, look, I'm going to pray that you would continue to think about ways to be set apart. I'm going to pray that your love abounds for one another. I'm going to pray that your baptism matters. And um, I I think even though Paul doesn't mention baptism to the Thessalonians, I I hear baptismal language through this entire letter. It's, It's the mark of discipleship that you live a baptized life because you love other people differently. You live a baptized life because you treat one another differently. So really that's my invitation to you as we kind of bring this to a conclusion. It's that we live like no one else. Um, I don't know what you think about Dave Ramsey. Uh, I think he's got some really good things that he says about our finances and our personal finances. I know here at Highland Oaks, we've got some uh, pretty staunch advocates for for Dave and his principles. And listen, if, if Dave can encourage you to, to save money and uh, create a uh, uh, an account that is there for times of crisis, hey, great. But one of the things Dave says that I, I think is is indicative of what Paul is trying to say is that Dave says, you need to live like no one else so that you can live like no one else. In other words, there are sacrifices to make now so that you can eventually live like no one else. Now, of course, Dave is talking about paying off your home and don't don't strive for those immediate gratifications. You live like no one else so that you can eventually live like no one else. But the end is not financial security. Uh, The end for the disciples of Jesus is the eternal assurance that this world is not the end, that there's something more, that God is redeeming this world um, back to himself. And there's a way to live like no one else so that we can live like no one else. So I invite you to think about for just a moment all of these things that we've talked about with the Thessalonians, with the the idea of the good news of their faith and their love and the, the encouragement that the Thessalonians have given Paul and the reality of them standing firm and that Night and day, Paul prays for them, uh, for whatever is lacking in their faith. I want you to think about all of those things and ask yourself the following question. Um, you know, what is something that you can do to increase or make your love abound for someone else? Um, maybe it's reaching out to someone on social media that you haven't touched base with. Maybe it's sending a text. Um, maybe it's making a goofy face in the camera and posting that on Facebook just to make people smile. Um, you know, you need to look for ways to try to help that love that Christ has given you to reach out to other people. Next week, we're going to jump into uh, chapter four and where Paul makes a, a turn into some some teaching material. Um, and it's interesting because as I'm reading here in my Bible, Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, but then Paul goes on and on and his finally is is a lot of words. So, uh, so anyway, friends, I hope you have um, a great day. I hope to see you in, a, in our gathering online here in a few moments. And uh, we just look forward to being together again whenever God allows. God bless you.